Good morning and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Dave Deacon. You may have heard the 2008 Farm Bill has been extended on into 2013. And we have Jody Campici here to walk us through what this means for Oklahoma producers. Well, for the most part, Oklahoma producers won't see much of a change from the 2012 crop year. Mm -hmm. uh, direct payments, acre payments, counter sickle payments were all extended into the 2013 crop year. So again, it'll be about the same as this previous crop year. Okay, now the farm bill was pretty well gone or, or dead in the water back in just a couple months ago. What got the wheels going again on it? Well, we had some dairy uh, milk price supports that were expiring at the end of December. Mm -hmm. Now, if we didn't do something, either pass a new farm bill or pass an extension of the 2008 farm bill, we would revert back to permanent law of 1949 to 1938. What this could mean is uh, very, very high milk prices. So Congress definitely wanted to avoid that. So in an effort to avoid uh, reverting back to permanent law, that's when the extension came about. Okay, now there are some things that, that were extended, but there's not going to be total funding for. You want to talk about that? Yes, especially the livestock disaster programs that have been very important to Oklahoma producers, uh, especially in 2011. Those programs actually expired at the end of October of 2011. So they had no funding through 2012 either. The House and the Senate Ag Committees actually came up with an extension uh, prior to the passage of this ta American Taxpayer Relief Bill. Mm -hmm. And in that package, they included mandatory funding for the livestock disaster disaster programs. However, the, the Senate actually cut out the mandatory funding and just included an authorization of appropriations. So what that means is that Appropriations Committee actually will decide later on if those programs will actually get funding. So that could happen in the appropriations process. Uh, the funding for the livestock programs could also be part of a bigger package for Hurricane Sandy relief. Part of that package has already been passed, but part of it will be looked at on January 15th. The other option is for the livestock disaster programs to be in the new Farm Bill, which they were in both the House and Senate versions of the 2012 Farm Bill last year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so you said the magic word 2012 Farm Bill. Do you think that they will start working on a 2013 Farm Bill? Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. The 2008 extension goes through September 30th of 2013, so uh, not quite at the end of this year. Right. But the American Taxpayer Relief Act that this was uh, funded to avoid the fiscal cliff. Right. Uh, it actually extended the automatic budget cuts that were supposed to occur uh, starting in January. So those will extend through March of this year. So we only have a couple months till those cuts will start taking place. It's quite possible that they'll start looking at a new farm bill uh, prior to that to try to get a farm bill in place before these automatic cuts come about. But again, there's no guarantee at this point when that's gonna happen. Okay, so, so as far as policy goes, what should Oklahoma producers be thinking about in the, in the very near future? Uh, for the most part, they should be getting the payments uh, that they have been getting. But what I do caution is that don't uh, necessarily depend on the direct payments for 2013 until we get a little more information. Right now, they're included in the extension, which means that they should get them for 2013, but those payments don't go out until uh, October of 2013. So again, they should get them the way that it's currently set up, but if Congress passes a new farm bill, you know, in the next few months, there is a possibility that they could go back and say, hey, we're not going to give you those direct payments. I don't anticipate that happening since it is in the extension, but I just don't want everyone to rush out and, and think for sure that they're going to be getting them. Well, there really isn't a, a crystal ball when it comes to Congress, is there? No, definitely not. <laughs> Jody Campici, thank you very much. And for more information on what we talked about today, you can go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. The door has closed on 2012. For Oklahoma, it was another year of drought and heat, not the kind of weather we needed. Weather over the last two and a half years has made it really tough for our Oklahoma farmers and ranchers. To help, the Oklahoma Mesonet team worked hard in 2012 to add new weather information and tools to our mesonet.org website. 
agriculture on the Mesonet went through a major change, we introduced the new Mesonet agriculture section with a new Mesonet farm monitor. This new single screen provides Mesonet data, National Weather Service capsule forecasts, and 10 indicators of important farm and ranch weather for a single Mesonet site. Products from the retired Ag Weather website were completely redesigned to work on the Mesonet.org website and make them easier to use and view on mobile devices. We added a new cattle comfort advisor that continuously monitors heat and cold cattle stress. On a single chart, you can see stress over the last 10 days and what is forecast for the next three and a half days. New plant available water maps show how much water in inches is stored in the soil for plants from the soil surface down to 32 inches. By using the same unit measure, water stored in the soil, rainfall amounts, and plant water use can easily be compared. Under past data and files, new long-term Mesonet average maps allow folks to compare any one month to the long-term monthly average, or a single month from two different years for any Mesonet data set. Mesonet added a forecast section with forecasts linked to individual Mesonet sites. Regional forecast maps from each National Weather Service office serving Oklahoma and access to national precipitation forecast maps that show rainfall totals over the next five days. New temperature forecast maps are a handy way to check statewide maximum and minimum temperatures, especially important as we jump from warm days like Friday to cold nights like tonight. To better serve our mobile users, Mesonet introduced a new free Mesonet iPhone app. Over on the Mesonet mobile website, a new mobile version of the Great Black Rot Advisor was added. And in 2012, a number of Mesonet sites celebrated 20 years of operation. We hope these new products provide the weather information and tools you need to have a more profitable year in 2013. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to being with you again for another Mesonet Weather Report. Joining us once again, our gray marketing specialist, Kim Anderson. Kim, a lot of folks are confused about things going on in the market. They think it should be going up. It is going down. Help us sort out why that's happening. Well, the market has, it's what, fallen off over a dollar in the, in the last several weeks. Uh, a lot of people are saying, why are prices going down with the crop conditions uh, in, so bad? And what we've seen is that we came in into early December with the funds holding a lot of long positions in both corn and wheat, and they started liquidating those long posi positions, and they liquidated them throughout the, the December time period. So with very little change in the supply and demand situation for corn and wheat, the, the funds were selling uh, their contracts. There was very few buyers. You know, we talked about the holiday time period, a very thin market, and therefore prices fell. Okay, so if you want to be grumbling about prices, you're grumbling about the funds. That's exactly correct. It's uh, really, it's the funds' fault that prices fell. But we also got to remember that it's the funds' fault that wheat prices were up in that eight fifty and nine dollar range for a while because the funds were buying. They were they were increasing their long positions during that time period, and it gave our producers to sell wheat at eight dollars and fifty cents to nine dollars when without the funds they wouldn't have had that opportunity. All right, but that price brings up this point: when a producer goes out and they see a field looking like this, bare. And, and looking bad right now, they're looking at that, that June price contract and thinking this should be going up. You know, we have a low crop. Why is it, you know, still dropping there? Well, the, the July price is going to follow the March price and the corn price is down. But what we've seen is, is that the current price, you can forward contract for harvest deliveries somewhere around $7.60, $7.65, $7.70. If you'll look back over the last five years, let's go back to 2008. The average June price was $7.93. In 2009, it was $5.75. In 10, it was $3.75. And I think that's a case of the funds being 
being uh, almost record short and driving the price down too far. Far, I think it should have been 440, but still it's 375 and 10, 762 in 2011, and six dollars and 48 cents this last year. Now you average them out, you got six dollars and 31 cents for five years. June average price. If you can forward contract for 760, 770, you know that's that's a dollar and thirty to a dollar and forty cents above the average price. So the price is still relatively high, and it's above that relatively high. And they're offering 760 because of fills like this. Okay. Now yesterday, to shift notes, we we had a very big day at the USDA. Several important reports came out. What is that going to mean for the market? Well, I, it's going to set the, the stage for the market for the next couple of months. It's going to build a foundation. What we see prices do on Monday and Tuesday, we're going to, we're going to go to levels uh, that are based on these reports that will, will be the starting point that price for we're looking for at June. It's going to be the starting point for, for that price level to either go up and down from that point. Okay, uh, so what prices are you keeping an eye on? I'm watching the March contract, that $8. Once we break through that, then we got another 50 down to, to uh, $7.50 for support. We break 750, we can go down to seven. To get the uh, current price, take 50 off of July contract, looking at 820 and 770. Take right. 50 cents off that, and you've got the June average price, or the June uh, predicted price. All right, good information as always. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Last winter, of course, was one of the mildest uh, on recent uh, record, and so far this winter, most of Oklahoma has escaped extremely cold temperatures, except for perhaps the, the far western panhandle. We haven't had those sub-zero type temperatures, and we haven't had to calve in that kind of condition for a couple of years. But before we make it through this winter, there's of course the likelihood that we'll have some extremely cold nights during this spring calving season. And that brings about the question, what to do when we find a baby calf that's been born in a very, very cold night, and perhaps this calf has gotten itself into what we call a hypothermic condition, or his body temperature is just quite low. Actually, there's been some research that's been done on the subject as the, to the best way to rewarm cold stressed calves. They've looked at methods such as bringing the calf in, putting him underneath a heat lamp in room environment, something about 70 degrees, or putting the calf wrapped in a nice warm blanket in a room environment. Compared that with actually submersing the body of the calf in warm water. And that's the one that did the best job of rewarming the calf the quickest. You see, what the research has indicated is that if we can submerge that hypothermic calf in about 100 degree water so that that surrounds his body, we want to remember, of course, to keep the head above water. We don't want to drown the calf we're trying to save. But that, in that method, that calf regains body temperature much more quickly and therefore preserves some of the stored body energy that he has to help him make it through the next few days. If you find a calf in the middle of the winter in one of those extremely cold nights and you think his body temperature is below normal, put him into a warm bath. Something such as a big wash tub, even the bathtub in the house, at about normal bath water temperature, keep his head above water, and you'll rewarm that calf and he'll come back to life much more quickly than if you do it with a blanket or a heat lamp. We need to save as many of these calves as possible with the price that they are and with the high cost of feed and the other inputs, we've got to have as many of those calves make it to market so that we can make ends meet on our ranching operation. We hope this tip helps you in this year's calving season and we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Well, it's that time of year to take down the Christmas lights and put the tree out of the curb. It's also the time our friend Craig McKinley tends to hear from folks who want to buy a tree farm. Now, you hear about that almost every year. I do. I get those calls uh, about every year because people go out and they uh, buy a tree. Uh, of course, they pay a pretty good price for some of those trees. And next thing I know is they're calling me saying, all you have to do is plant them and watch them grow, right? 
<laughs> right, and it's that easy, right? No, it's not quite that easy. <laughs> There's a, a lot that goes into a Christmas tree uh, production facility, and uh, it, it, it's a business, and some people don't uh, realize that it is. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about that business, and let's start with artificial trees, because that is such a, you know, you see them in all the stores, but there really is still a market, a big market, for the real life thing. There's a, there's a fairly large market for uh, what we call real trees. Uh, in the United States, we have about 100 million households. And so we kind of count trees on the basis of households, and about 30% of those households will use a real tree. Uh, others will use the artificial tree or no tree at all. Okay. Now, once someone decides that they want to go into this business, first of all, I guess let's talk a little about Oklahoma itself. What kind of, of, of opportunities are there here in the state? Well, it depends on the kind of uh, marketing they would like to attempt, but most of the Oklahoma growers uh, use a choose and cut method, which means they need to be close to a population center. Uh, they have to have the customers to don't want to drive two or 300 miles just to pick out a tree. So Tulsa and Oklahoma counties are our two biggest producing areas. Okay, so right there and around the major metro areas. Uh, let's talk about the maintenance that goes in. What all is involved in actually putting the, you know, just put a tree in and then walk away and come back in a couple years, right? There's, there's a lot to go on. Absolutely. The first thing a person should do is probably just start the planting process a year or two before they ever get into the actual planting of the trees themselves. Uh, how many trees, what species, what is their market? Who do they want to cater to? All of those things and which lead right up to site preparation, planting, and then there's management and uh, production operations up until time of uh, sale. Just a very intensive business then. Absolutely. Uh, most people will get into it thinking that it's a part-time business. I had one lady tell me, says, it's every weekend. Can you talk us through a few of the different varieties folks should look at? I mean, right here we have a, an unusual tree to my, to my eye, but you say this is one that can be used as a Christmas tree as this, well. This is the Arizona cypress, and while it is an exotic tree, most of our trees are exotic. They're just not native to Oklahoma. This is a very nice tree species. Many people like to plant it, use it as a choose and cut species. The number one choose and cut species in Oklahoma is Virginia pine. Almost 90% of our production is Virginia pine. All right, well, good information as always. Craig McKinley, our extension Christmas tree specialist. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk a little bit about bending sheet metal and layout for uh, making a, a box. Okay, the, here's, a, here's a completed box and what we're going to do is show you how you have to lay one of these out to create, this is called a hem right here, this very top where it's folded over and then to make, roll up the corners and, uh, and then we're going to show you how to spot weld in, in the next segment. But uh, basically when you're laying one of these out, how do we do that, Randy? Well, the big key is, is where you're going to bend it and you're going to fold your tabs over, you need to, be, you need to notch it back so that you can actually bend it to 90 degrees and, uh, and get the thing upright. Yes, and, and another thing is when you hem these, uh, you got to taper the top too so that that tab will also fit inside the hem. Now, another thing you need to think about after you lay it out is, is how you're going to bend it up to, to uh, do it in a certain order because if you don't do it in a certain order you're, you're not going to get a box. But a good thing to remember is to, is to, like we've said in one of our segments before, is use layout fluid which is this blue stuff here. You can use other things and then you can see the scribe marks very easily after that. So get the thing laid out correctly, uh, bend it in the proper order and uh, it'll come up square with nice corners, a nice top, a nice smooth edge on the top so that uh, so you don't cut your hand on it. We're going to use what's called a box break, but one thing when you start bending up your box, you need to you need to anticipate where your bends need to be so you don't bend yourself into a corner, kind of like painting yourself into a corner. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do what's called a hem, this one right here, and that's that's this bend up here, but we're going to do it from the opposite side, so we've marked it here. So we're going to bend the top over first, get that flat, get a nice smooth edge on what will end up being the top of our box, and then we'll start bending the tabs up. Okay, yeah, we want to bend the, the sides with these tabs because if we bend this one up first, as you can tell, I can't bend that tab in my break, so I'm going to bend 
this side first with our tabs, and then this side, and then I'm going to finish up by uh, bending the last two. And now that we've got it all bent and uh, in the proper shape, we're going to spot weld our corners together. Okay. Uh, the thing about spot welding, a lot of you may not have them. You may want to use pop rivets or not, but when you're spot welding, you have to preset your spot welder so that it doesn't get too hot, kind of like regular welding, so it doesn't make a, a big pock mark in here. And if you want a good uh, little spot like that's shown there. Otherwise, you can have a cold weld, and the cold weld is just as bad as it won't stick the two parts together. And so that's what we've done with this box. We've got a nice little handy small box we can use, uh, or we could have made it a little larger if we had a different plan for it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Shop Stop. Well, we made it into 2013, and it's time to look at cattle markets with our good friend Daryl Peel. Daryl, let's look at how 2012 compares with 2013. You know, if you look at total beef production in 2013, we're projecting a, a significant decrease this year, about 4.8% at this point. Uh, that compares to 2012, where we had, uh, uh, we wound up with about a 1.1% decrease. In 2012, we had a significant decrease, about a 4.5% drop in slaughter, but that was offset by higher carcass weights in 2012. In 2013, we're going to see about a 5% decrease in slaughter, but really no change or very little increase in carcass weight. So the, the slaughter drop translates pretty directly into the decrease in beef production. Okay, so what could change that going into 2013? Well, obviously, we still have drought conditions going forward. Drought has modified the timing of beef production the last two years, and it could do it again. Uh, we, could, we could moderate that a little bit. If, if we go another three months or so and still have drought conditions, we'll see additional liquidation that we're not planning on, not intending to do. That would, uh, you know, that would uh, modify the decrease somewhat on beef production. It'll still be down, but it might not be down as much temporarily. But of course, it implies that later on it would be even more severe. When so, it would change the timing either into the later part of the year or into next year. Okay, so let's let's talk about a, a, a producer's perspective on this. Well, again, we're, you know, this is largely driven by decrease in slaughter, right. and so we have less cattle. We're going to see less steer and heifer slaughter. We're going to see less cow slaughter as well. And again, the, the cow slaughter really becomes one of the big factors in terms of whether we have you know, uh, a, a sharp decrease because we're trying to stop liquidating the herd or whether we have less of a decrease because we are continuing to liquidate because of the drought. Okay, and, and on, on a side note on that, when, when do you think we will see the numbers leveling off as far as liquidating the herd? With no drought in 2013, we kind of stabilized the numbers, and then we probably really don't begin to build at least until 2014. Wow, okay. So, well, let, let's take another look at that, the consumer side of, of the production there. Well, you know, production goes down, that implies less consumption, but you have to modify that a little bit because of the trade. We both import and export beef, so they don't translate necessarily directly. The 4.8% projected decrease in, in beef production in 2013 mm -hmm. will translate, we think, into about a 3.5% decrease in beef consumption on a per capita basis in 2013. So it will be down. That's a pretty sharp decrease, about like it was in 2011. So it does imply much more pressure on wholesale and retail prices, but not quite as much as the production decrease. The bigger decrease in both production and consumption may happen actually in 2014. Wow. So there's, it's, it's still out there. It's going to take some time because of the situation we're in. We're looking at, uh, yeah, at least through 2014 with very restricted production, and that'll impact consumption as well. Okay, there you go. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And of course, cattle are not the only animals grazing across Oklahoma. Here's Austin with more. This group of ranchers gathered in Ada, Oklahoma this fall, not to talk about cattle, but to focus in on goats. Goats are the fastest growing group of livestock in the nation. Still way, way, way far behind cattle. But uh, a lot of people that are new to livestock are more comfortable with an animal that's not going to kill them. The kids can't really get out there with the cows and everything until they get ran over. But with goats, I have my little two-year-old. She goes out and feeds them, and she's got her bottle babies. And I think it's... It brings our family together more, you know, being outside on the farm and not inside, and um, we just enjoy it. Holly was actually in the cattle business and got out to get into goats, but she found the transition wasn't as easy as one might think. 
it's harder. I believe it's harder. Um, it's a lot more maintenance to them. That is why Holly is here at the Meat Goat Boot Camp held annually by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service. This is three days of intense, immersive lessons in the goat industry. We tell people to expect uh, a minimum of 30 hours of actual instruction in that three-day period. So we throw a lot of information at them. Uh, we send a lot of materials home, and a lot of it they have to kind of digest and before it clicks together. So, so it is a pretty uh, intense program. It's not for, for those who are uh, looking for a, a social. But that level of focus does lead to some unexpected bonds. Because they're thrown into the crucible together, they really, they really bond as a group. And I think every year when it's time to go home Wednesday, we've had a few of the students that are crying because they don't want to leave. Uh, they've met new people, new friends. So the education continues as they go home, then they, they will work with people from across the country they may never see again, but maintain a telephone relationship about what they're seeing and how they're handling their problems. Now you have somebody, you know, you can sit here and talk to somebody that actually knows what you're going through and all of the different breeds and everything that you're talking about and they, they can relate and respond back to you and I think that's, that's really beneficial for everybody here at the camp. With students over the years from more than 40 different states and four different countries and counting, that makes for a mighty network of producers all looking to raise better meat. I've never tasted it. We actually have one going tomorrow to get butchered, and I'm so excited because I get to try out all my goat recipes. And that prospect is something Holly and the rest of these ranchers hope you find exciting too. And if you'd like more information on the Meat Goat Boot Camp, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Otherwise, that does it for us this week on Sunup. We'll see you next week.